of One Spartanburg Inc., formerly the Spartanburg Area Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you to the Caffeinated Conversations presented by Wells Fargo. This is a way in which we bring timely information on timely topics to the business community on an ongoing basis. Obviously, over the past year, we've been doing it a little differently, um, but I still believe, thanks to the hard work of John Turner and, and the rest of our team, we've still been very effective in making sure that you have what you need to make informed decisions. And today is definitely going to be all about information. We are so excited to have Chris Gant Sorensen with Hainsworth Sinclair Boyd with us today. Um, we're going to hear from her in a moment, but before we do that, I want to call on Ethan Burroughs. Ethan is with Wells Fargo. They've really been with us from the very beginning of Caffeinated Conversations and Above and beyond their financial support, Ethan has invested a ton of his time on our executive board. So we thank him for that. And I'm going to allow him to just give us a greeting from Wells Fargo. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, we're certainly proud to be a sponsor of this event and uh, certainly appreciate the opportunities not only to sponsor this event, but also to get engaged with the community and a lot of the other things that the chamber does. And uh, we've been very pleased with the partnership that we've had um, over this past year. You're right, it is, it's certainly been very, very different as we've delivered these caffeinated conversations, but I've been very pleased about the topics and, and the, the topic we have today is very timely and I appreciate everybody joining us. And I'm sure you will get a, a lot out of of the information that's presented today. So thank you for joining us. And Alan, I'll turn it back over to you and Jonna. Thank you so much, Ethan. I also want to mention Regenesis Healthcare. Uh, they're sponsoring this caffeinated conversations as well. And they are just doing an incredible job in this community. We know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted people of color, and they're really on the front lines ensuring that you know people are having sufficient access to testing. Um, access to resources, and then now um, helping with vaccinations as well. So uh, we have been saying through our Bring Back the Bird Business Recovery Task Force for a long time now that the economy will recover as quickly as we address the health issue. And so um, in this community that's happening rapidly, we could, we could spend an entire caffeinated conversation on the positive economic metrics of Spartanburg right now. And so maybe that'll be, maybe that'll be next month's John. But again, we're happy to have with us uh, Chris Gant Sorensen. Also want to mention too, we've got Angie Omer with Senator Graham's office and Danielle Gibbs with Senator Scott's office. They are just uh, an incredible resource for us. Very responsive, uh, both of the senators, whatever the issue is, we reach out to them and, and we get an answer. And so we thank them for joining us. Today's topic is, is so important. You know, whenever there's a new administration, there's always questions about, you know, are there going to be new regulations? What is the NLRB going to look like? You know, what, you know, simple things like how do I calculate overtime? And all, all these, you know, big and then maybe minor tactical things, are, are they going to be subject to change? So we're very delighted to have uh, Chris with us today. She is the employment law practice team leader, as I said, at Hains Hainsworth Sinclair Boyd. She works exclusively with all types of employers, providing advice and counsel. With 29 years of experience, she advises employers and HR professionals on issues that arise daily, particularly in the areas of FMLA, ADA, ACA, FLSA, and Title VII. She defends clients and employment related claims and litigation before administrative agencies such as the DOL and the EEOC, as well as in state and federal courts. And if there was another acronym, we'd have to throw that in there too, Chris. I think we covered every single letter in the alphabet, uh, but we are so happy to have you. So welcome to the Caffeinated Conversations. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alan and Ethan and um, everybody here today. I'm excited to be here and to speak with you. I'm joined by Keely Yates in our office, um, who is integral to everything that we do. Um, she's our director of marketing, but she's so much more than that. And so Keely's going to be helping me with the slides today. Um, so before I get started, though, um, we want to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about our firm. We have five offices. Um, well, I'm sorry, four offices. We had one in Myrtle Beach um, and we recently um, 
removed that one, but <laughs> four offices in Charleston, Columbia, Florence, and Greenville. And um, we provide services obviously throughout the state. We also have folks that are admitted in um, our neighboring states. And so we're able to um, help out um, employers, businesses in those states as well on um, every, most every topic. So the South Carolina Employers Blog is a place where you can get timely updates in regards to employment law. We don't write when um, there's nothing to write about. We only write when there's something you need to know. We're not one of those um, firms or those publications that drop something in your box every week. And the rule, I had a rule early on that it wouldn't be more than five to 700 words and it wouldn't be boring and it wouldn't be in legalese. And so I think we've managed to achieve that. We also have um, complimentary webinars and we hold those once a, once a month on the fourth Thursday from 12 to one. And those are announced on the blog and those also deal with employment law. So I would encourage you to sign up for this resource. A lot of folks use it. We've got clients, um, you know, folks that aren't clients, lawyers use it. So um, we hear that it's very helpful um, and, and that's the best place to hear of something that's happening in the employment law arena. Um, also, HSB has developed a COVID-19 resource page, and it, it, of course, lists all of the employment blogs and all of our webinars, but it also deals with real estate, with business, with um, tax, with every single area of the law. There's all kinds of complimentary resources there. To Alan's good point, one of the blogs that I wrote back in May is the map to recovery financially is, of course, the health related criteria and protecting it. That's the best way to return fully to financial status. So I'm just thrilled to hear Alan say that. And I would encourage you um, to check out the Map to Road to Recovery blog, which was back in May. Um, had I known he would have said that, I would have had it ready. Um, but of course that's absolutely true. And the International Monetary Fund said the same in April um, that the way to return to full duty is to keep ourselves safe enough to where we don't have to shut down, to where we keep our infection rates low. So I was really tickled to hear Alan say that. Thank you. And Ethan, thank you for um, the sponsorship and all that Wells Fargo does. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, Biden's very ambitious plan is like any president's ambitious plan when they come into office. And you can already see this plan that um, was introduced really in December, January. You can already see what of course happens to any president's plan once it starts filtering through Congress. Most of the things that Biden um, has in his plan would require Congress to pass. And so a great example is going to be the COVID um, bill, You know, the $1.9 billion relief package. That has already had some tenants removed to, from it and it's been narrowed. Um, and that's, you know, what's what you expect to happen. So please take this with a grain of salt is my point. These are the plans, this is the plan. I'm, I'm covering it from a 30,000 foot view. But of course, what really gets enacted is a different story. Now, the exception to that are the administrative agencies where the president is permitted to appoint the, the heads of the agencies and also has a lot of control over the federal agencies about what direction they take. There's a difference between executive agencies and independent agencies. And so the best examples of this will be the Department of Labor, the EEOC and the NLRB. Without fail, each time we get a new president in and employers, you already know this, um, we always see a change in the makeup of the NLRB commission, and that's that's no different here. Um, before it had two Republicans, um, one was heading it and the one was number two. They're, they've been removed and replaced by Democrats. Um, and you'll also see them go more towards um, pro-employee uh, reports and commissions and, um, um, you know, positions. And then when it's Republican, you'll see it slide the other way. And it's, it's almost like it's just a sliding scale that moves back and forth, um, you know, every four years or every eight years. Same with the EOC, although less so because the EOC um, is governed by bodies of law that have been around forever. And while they can offer a good bit of guidance on how they're going to interpret it, Historically, the EOC has always been very employee friendly, regardless of what president is in office. 
And so you're going to see less fluctuation there, although, of course, you do see a change in the figureheads. The Department of Labor is one that is very susceptible to executive influence. And so you already saw um, opinion letters and positions that the Department of Labor issued on gig workers um, be walked back and um, a few other things. So you'll see that happening. That's very common. We, that's stuff we update on our blog. But those are things that you can expect for the president, the executive office to implement and infect, affect the most. All right, so executive order. That is an interesting tool. And so many of the executive orders that are handed down don't necessarily have any pro, you know, any practical way. That's not entirely true. But um, for instance, when President Trump took office, the very first executive order he issued was that the Affordable Care Act penalty should be um, not should not be enforced, and there should be a great leniency with those wherever possible. Well, the IRS hasn't changed anything that it's done. Right now, it's on the 2018 um, coverage letters. You know, the letters where they're um, sending it out looks like employers haven't complied. You know, all the penalty letters. Hopefully, y'all have no experience with those. But you know, they just marched right along. Um, and so, again, take the executive orders with a grain of salt. But it is a way for a president to come immediately into office and get the position out um, and start pushing their platform. Um, pro presidential administrations, the Democratic nominees tend to be pr more pro-labor. I don't think that's any news to you. And I will say though, that that is one of President Biden's um, longstanding positions is pro-labor. And as we know, the PRO Act um, is something that is being considered and may end up um, getting passed. The thinking is it's highly unlikely that it'll get passed past the Senate, but um, it, it did make it past the House. So let's go ahead and slide to the next slide. And you guys, if you have any questions, make sure you drop them in the chat and um, Keely will help me keep up with them and we'll take a, we'll take a, um, a quick break to look at those and try to answer what we can online. And if we can't online, then offline. So this is Biden saying, I'm gonna be the strongest labor president that you've ever had. And um, that's absolutely true. And I think you can absolutely anticipate changes where he can affect the most change, for instance, in the NLRB, NLRB and the Department of Labor. Uh, but otherwise you're gonna to have to have Congress's buy-in on a lot of the plans he has. Next slide. So he wanted to act quickly on the LGBTQIA and equality issues. Well, on February 6, 2020, the house already passed the Equality Act. And the Equality Act mirrors the Supreme Court's opinion in Bostick, which was from last summer. And you may recall that the Supreme Court has already held that Title VII, which is the body of law that prohibits discrimination and harassment on the basis of any protected class, also includes sexual orientation and gender identity. So that already is, for lack of a better way of describing it, the law of the land. If you were to retain me to help you understand in regards to any claim that had been made by someone who falls into the LGBTQIA community, um, if they would have protections under Title VII, I would have told you yes before the Equality Act was passed because of the Supreme Court's very clear guidance. And this is not news. Actually, the Supreme Court was issuing opinions similar to this since 1989. And so that would have been my advice for some time. The Equality Act merely does exactly what the Supreme Court did in Boston, Bostick by just codifying that the LGBTQIA community is protected under sex and gender in the Title VII. And specifically sexual orientation, gender identity, sexual preference. Now as a practical matter, what that means is there's a lot of protections that align with more, um, you know, the issues that typically bother your employees um, on the ground, for instance, restaurant you, uh, restroom use, choice of restroom use, you know, how are you dealing with that? OSHA already has guidance about that that's been out for some time that says an employer who has a unisex bathroom has to have it the same distance in the same location, same area, so that the employees who are going to choose to use that restroom rather than the traditional male female don't have to travel further you also shouldn't assign a specific restroom to anyone. You should allow them to use the restrooms of the choice. Those are the areas where you ultimately see the most concerns. And from an employment law standpoint, a lot of times I'm getting called about supervisors um, that are either taking positions in regards to employees about that or 
are allowing other employees to make comments. Conversely, there are a number of um, em employees and employee workplaces that are very supportive. And you know, HR folks have been very surprised um, by the reaction. So it just depends on what your workforce is like. But what I will say is when you get ready to do your Title VII, your harassment discrimination training, make sure you're addressing this issue. Make sure that your policies are updated. And um, you know, I have always had the position that sex included this work, this demographic. But go ahead and spell it out in your policies because it's been interpreted in the past that it doesn't. So spell out sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, put all of that in your um, Title VII and harassment policies that are in your handbook. Also your EEO policy. Any policy that addresses protected status needs to be updated. DACA is another one and um, H-1B visas, um, another one and that's not a surprise. The repeal of the new independent contractor Department of Labor regulations, they just came out last year and then they've been repealed. So, um, or they will be repealed. Um, and so these are all things that you can anticipate. Um, I think you can look back to what was in place during the Obama administration in regards to that and to the extent that you're thinking strategic planning and um, think in terms of that um, and how you would comply and what changes you might need to make. As with most any change, with few exceptions, the Equality Act being one of them, you usually have a period of time before they take place. So you can also rest assured that there'll be time for you to get in line with that. OSHA, this is an interesting one. Um, in the executive order, and of course, COVID-19 was top of Biden's list. So in his first executive order, he did tell OSHA, you've got two weeks to update your guidelines in regards to COVID-19. Now, I thought that was interesting because those of you who've been keeping up with it, which all of us have now since last March, OSHA has been prolific in their COVID-19 guidelines and very clear about what they've expected. Um, I think by March, early April, there were eight guidances specific, well, one guidance, seven enforcement memos specific to COVID-19, and then they continued to issue guidance. There is guidance already out there on every single industry for the most part, um, guidance on what your workplace needs to look like, and then guidance on what they're going to investigate if they do investigate you. And I will tell you that I, I represent employers who have been investigated um, by both North Carolina and South Carolina OSHA. So this is definitely something that's ongoing. I will also tell you, and this should be a relief, that if you follow OSHA's 3990 guidance, the first guidance that they put out. If you follow that, and remember that also ties back into the CDC's May 6 guidance and, and its updates, then even if there is a concern, usually your investigator is going to find that you've done everything you need to do. So we're finding them to be, you know, very reasonable and um, following their own guidance, you know, the 3990 guidance to make sure that employers are compliant. So that should give you some, you know, calm. And some of you may have already been investigated by that, um, by OSHA. I'm sure you don't want to volunteer it, but I'm always interested in hearing your experiences because they can help form my advice for clients and also any sort of comments we make in the future. But anyway, so Biden did say, look, you've got two weeks to give us an update. And OSHA did it. OSHA did it. And so we're going to run through that at the end of the um, the, the webinar, we're going to still keep covering Biden's plans and things you need to think about. But if we don't get to it, all you need to do is look at the slides towards the end, and you will see where we've outlined that for you. And I know, I believe that um, you will have the slides. Certainly, we intend for you to have the slides. All right. The other thing that was important to note is that the platform calls the OSHA guidance and 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 Biden's executive order calls for OSHA to double the number of investigators. I will say that my experience has been every investigator I've spoken with, they're slammed and they're trying to get through as many of these investigations as they can. And of course that makes sense. So if this does happen, I think you might see more of a return to on the ground um, investigations. And I know that there's been some reluctance on OSHA's part to subject their employees to possible exposure, but as, you, as that possibility declines and everybody gets their feet under them after last year, which it was a tough year, and this year has started out to be as well, and they're not scrambling as much anymore, I think you can anticipate there will be some investigations. The other thing I'm going to remind you about is if you have had any investigation and you've provided response to it and you've been cleared, 
OSHA keeps that information that you provided for one year and has the right to come back and revisit any of the additional information that you've provided them within the year. Next slide. So I think I've covered this pretty well. Um, all right, Department of Labor. Thanks, Keely. Get ahead of myself sometimes in the slides because I'm not reading them, I'm just talking. Um, so the Department of Labor has been populated, as I indicated, by um, more pro-labor folks. Um, the minimum salary threshold to be eligible for overtime is a plan to, um, of the Department of Labor. And I think that um, that's gonna be an interesting plan because you can't do that without Congress voting on it. And I think you've seen that recently in regards to the addition to the 1.9 COVID relief bill of 15 hour um, wage, minimum wage rate. So I think there'll be a lot of trouble getting that passed. I think you could almost anticipate that it'll follow the same track as the salary basis. Um, and if you remember, that was a pretty high salary and then initially it got dropped about $10,000 and it took a period of a year or so. So I think you can anticipate that the minimum wage increase is gonna have the same resistance and the same track. Um, I think you should be more concerned about the reclassification issues in my opinion. Um, there was a lot of helpful to, um, to employers and businesses. There was a lot of helpful guidance that came out um, during the last administration that I, I'm certain will be walked back. And my concern about that guidance was always that the IRS and the Department of Labor might not agree. Um, and especially the IRS. As you well know, misclassification is a moneymaker for the IRS. And the IRS is also very diligent in enforcing that. And if you misclassify workers as independent contractors when ind indeed they're employees, that means you're not paying any federal or state taxes or social security administration taxes. And so that is something that's always been an issue with the IRS. It's something that's always been a hot button issue. And it's something that needs to be weighed by every single business who considers using 1099 independent contractors very, very carefully, regardless of who's in office, because the IRS makes its own independent decisions. The Department of Labor, also true. And the investigators, you know, the folks on the ground that are performing the analysis into misclassification don't usually change with administrations. It's only the top level folks. So you might be reading a good bit of guidance and, and um, you know, news that sounds very pro-employee or pro-employer, but I find that the Department of Labor auditors and investigators, who I've also had a lot of experience with, are very pro-employee generally and um, very strict in regards to employers. So I don't necessarily think a lot of this has changed and I think it's always important. I continue to give advice on misclassification of independent contractors. Um, so keep that in mind. The revocation of the joint employer standard, I think they'll probably go back to more of the ABC California standard, but we'll have to see. Um, and it'll be interesting. So you definitely need to keep your eyes peeled on what's happening with the Department of Labor. Next slide. All right, so Affordable Care Act, um, and I'm taking things a little out of turn, definitely there's gonna be a push for a public option. Now I think it's interesting because um, if you think about the percentages, 55% of the employees, employers, well, let me back up, 55% of American citizens are insured by their employers. So the employer right now is the biggest provider of health insurance to the American public. I have my own personal opinions about whether that should be the case if it's gonna be mandated because I think employers are in the business of whatever their business is and employing employees. And it concerns me that they're now also tagged singularly. They're the only ones that are tagged with um, actually carrying health insurance and suffering penalties for failure to do so. I'm hoping that we'll see that reverse some because that's a heavy burden on businesses. Um, but my opinion aside, um, the public option is the next highest insurance. So we already have Medicare and Medicaid and um, CHIP and then TRICARE. And these are all public options that are already in place. And they come right under, I can't remember what the percentage is, but it's, it's right under the employer percentage, maybe like 40 something and I'm estimating um, total. So this is something that's already in place. Germany has a system that's similar to it. And there's a ton of opposition to it 
But what you also see is in the states that didn't expand Medicaid, you see increased health costs, less, um, less folks having health care, which ultimately increases all of our costs more because of how much they use um, the facilities, you know, the emergency room and such. Well, we all, those of us who are paying insurance and paying for our fees end up paying for that. So it'll be interesting to see if the position um, as a political tool changes. That's been a political tool since 2000 and since earlier, maybe entirely during um, the whole Congress background. It's always been a political tool since Teddy Roosevelt time. But um, it is going to be interesting to see if the percentages of coverage and how they actually impact our all costs will ultimately switch um, opinions on that. I will tell you back in 1986, the um, um, mandatory health insurance for individuals, you know, American citizens was a Republican idea. So I think we have to understand that the, the climate may change and shift back. Expansion of subsidies, the CSR cost sharing reduction payments have already begun again. Those are the payments that go to the insurance companies who are help subsidizing the people who take health insurance on the exchanges or the marketplace. So there's an anticipation that those will be expanded. Um, Cost sharing reductions the government can do from the executive office because it's part of their budget. Expanding the subsidies under the Affordable Care Act is going to have to, I believe, come with some sort of legislation from Congress. The Paycheck Fairness Act, that has been something I think you all know has been around for a while in the past several years. It kind of lost some footing once COVID hit, but that has been in the works both in our state um, and in a number of states, as well as in federal legislation, you know, you already have law that says you have to pay folks fairly without regard to gender and all the other statuses. But this just adds more teeth to it. Um, and of course, like any legislation, it'll be refined as it comes through, if it comes through. But I think the thing that's been most concerning to employers is removing any salary inquiries from either discussions or um, any sort of application, like what ranges of salary you want. And this act would also require employers to divulge what salary ranges are for positions that employees are advertising it, uh, or are interviewing for. Um, you can't restrict employees from discussing pay information. And I'll tell you, the National Labor Relations Act already says that's part of what are terms and conditions and employees should be able to, to um, speak to it. But the National Labor Relations Act is a little um, more diff difficult for the NLRB to enforce and you know, claims have to be filed with the NLRB. The fact that it would become federal law is gonna make it more um, expansive just because you know, that's gonna have more teeth to it. And then anti-retaliation and the penalties associated with it um, are increased. So it's a pretty detailed act. We actually covered this thoroughly, I think last year. Um, and I, we're glad to provide you with those slides so you have it if you um, become interested in those. But right now, just keep your eye out for it. Next slide. All right, the PRO Act, looking at my time, I get going. So the PRO Act is interesting. Um, it, first of all, I'll say, I think everybody knows it's unlikely to pass um, the Senate. I think the thing that's the most perplexing about the PRO Act is again, the reach um, from a misclassification misclassi standpoint. So franchisees or um, entities that are aligned with other entities, the franchisor may actually be determined to be the employer of franchisees employees. So those are the things I think that might have the most impact to um, our businesses. You also have um, protections that are being put in place for workers and for unions and um, a number of things that will make it easier for workers to organize. Um, they'll increase penalties for employers taking retaliatory action and um, some rules about not being able to terminate employees who have um, you know, engaged in a protest, striked, you know, organized. You know, our state already has a bill like that that's in place that has fines or penalties for employers retaliating or um, taking any action against an employee who either chooses to participate in a union or who does not. The thinking is the PRO Act will sort of dampen the right to work state, the right to work um, impact of a state because it would require all employees to be a member of any union, whether they wanted to or not. But 
you still, in my opinion, have an at will state where an employer can let anyone go with or without um, notice, with or without, without cause, as long as it's not illegal. I think where the, the issue comes in is if the union contract negotiates more protections around that law. So that will be something that I think um, is important to keep your eye on as well. Again, it's unlikely, the thinking is it's unlikely that it'll pass through the Senate unless it is substantially changed or watered down, but do keep your eye out for it. All right, I already mentioned the NLRB. I've talked about them to death, so I think we'll slide on. So this is essentially the four tenets of Biden's American Rescue Plan, and you already see some going into place now. The funding, the vaccinations, and the vaccinations definitely seem to be, you know, they're becoming more and more plentiful. You know, even in South Carolina next week, we start with a new group of people that are available for it. Um, so that's good, and you know, that's well underway. You know about the relief to families bearing the brunt of the COVID-19 crisis. That's the $1.9 billion bill that has been refined somewhat. Um, those who are entitled to the benefits have been narrowed to a little bit lower salary. Um, and then worker protections. So we'll touch on some of those. Next slide. So I thought this, these, these statistics were interesting when we um, gave this presentation earlier in the year to our um, employer group. 20% of the earned income, income tax credits go unclaimed. 40% of service workers who were laid off um, wait a minute, I'm reading that wrong. Less than 40% of the service workers who were laid off got unemployment benefits during COVID, during the furlough. That surprised me. And this didn't surprise me that 47% of the children um, in households had, the children that live in households had cover uh, trouble, sorry, covering their usual expenses such as, food, such as food, housing, and medical care. That was not a surprise. But I was very surprised by the percentage that less than 40% of the service workers who could have claimed unemployment benefits during COVID did. So um, obviously what that indicates is that either the payments were untimely or folks just didn't understand how to apply. Representing employers, I'm familiar on the other side of it with employees that are working who are also filing for unemployment claims. And as you all know, you all probably experienced some of this. Um, and unemployment claims this last year were just granted um, sort of summarily and it was almost like the appeal level became the first level where the um, where Dew was able to analyze whether or not employment benefits should be paid. I understand the need to get them out quickly and the increased number of claims. And so I'm not, um, you know, not criticizing that. There's certainly avenues to deal with it. And ultimately Dew ends up, at least in my experience, you know, making the decision on the right basis. But it did surprise me that employees who were working, who never lost their job and who weren't furloughed and continue to get paid, filed claims for unemployment benefits. And then you take that and you compare it to the number of um, folks that actually needed the, the assistance not getting it. It's interesting. So there's definitely some things that need to be changed in how it's administered. Next slide. Worker protections. Oop. Go back one. COBRA, I don't know, I'm sure um, many of you remember back during the Obama era when we had the um, economic decline in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, that there was um, a time period where the federal government would subsidize a portion of um, COBRA payments that um, you know em employees would have if they went on COBRA with their employers. There's thinking that that might go back into play here for a little while through September, 2021. Um, they um, are thinking that they'll be able to change the Affordable Care Act, you know, lowest expense for participating in the employer's health care plan from 9.5 to 8.5%. So if it costs your lowest paid worker more than 8.5% of their salary to participate in your plan, then they have the ability to go onto the marketplace and um, get coverage through the marketplace. And that in turn is going to alert, you know, the government that the employer maybe doesn't have an affordable plan and possibly subject the employer to penalties from the IRS. And so that is something that, that could happen. And then emergency funding to employers or first responders, responders and essential workers to keep the frontline workers on the job and paid. Um, you know, that's definitely a, um, something that's, that's being put forward or will be put forward. 
And then the increasing of the unemployment benefit you already know about. That's already been the bill that's being proposed. Next slide. Minimum wage increase. So that is something that I will say, you've already seen how difficult that's gonna to be to pass. And that can't pass unless it is passed through Congress. However, the federal government has a lot more control over that. And so Biden has directed the um, OMB office to come up with a plan for how they can increase, the federal government can increase any of its workers who are currently paid less than $15 an hour to a $15 an hour minimum. And so that is something that's underway and we'll be curious to see how that um, goes down. And as you know, with most or with many employment laws, often the benefits that end up trickling down to the private industry um, are first implemented in um, federal government. So that's something to keep your eye on. But again, I don't think it's necessarily anything that would happen quickly. I thought this was interesting um, and it would be helpful to small businesses. You know, you've seen so many businesses go out of business. Um, short time compensation problems, uh, compensation programs, there would be actually federal government subsidies going to small businesses that could stay in operation and keep their employees employed. So um, that's an interesting concept. And um, I am not entirely sure if that's part of the package, um, but you know, if that is and someone knows, I'd love to hear from you, even in the chat to um, help us know about that. Next slide. All right, COVID-19 worker protections. We talked about that. Um, one of the things I think that are interesting, you know, right now you already know that your employees can't refuse to come to work under OSHA unless they are threat of serious physical harm or imminent danger and they don't have time to actually make a complaint to OSHA um, and wait for OSHA to decide it. In other words, it's imminent. That's a pretty strict standard. Um, so part of the uh, Biden package is to lessen that standard that folks can refuse work. They can refuse work in this scenario if this were to pass, if they were worried that they might infect their um, family members. You know, right now, that's not necessarily something under the ADA that should be granted as an exception not to come to work. And so if that passes, then that is going to um, require employers to grant exceptions when an employee is present um, at work or required to be present at work and is concerned about the employee's family members or um, has other concerns about reporting to work, other fears or concerns that um, are not necessarily filing under the imminent danger or serious health condition issue. So it's, it's important to keep this in mind, although it really looks like um, as, as the numbers decrease, and I hope they continue to do that, that this will become less of an issue, but it is important to um, keep your eye peeled on our blog in case this does pass, because you will have to reconsider how you're considering any um, remote, rework, remote work request. Next slide. Enhance and extend the FFCRA. So, um, you know, the thought would be that it would become available to, um, all employees, even those with over 500 employees, um, as you know, the FFCRA when passed last year was limited to employers with under 500. Honestly, that was tough on the larger employers, especially the narrow margin ones. Um, so I don't know that this would be something that larger employers wouldn't be glad to see. And it would increase the covered folks to 106 million workers. So, but a lot of this is going to depend on how our rates are doing and whether this is the most pressing issue in Congress at the time. Next slide. This was an interesting um, addition that I thought would be problematic, especially for employers who are just um, over 50 or even 100, um, and maybe even a couple of hundred, is again putting more giving employees more um, extended EPSL and F EFMLA. So if you remember the Family Medical Leave Act portion of it last year, if you were an employee who needed to stay home with a school-aged child or either a child whose daycare was closed because of COVID, you could receive up to um, 10 weeks, 12 weeks of protect, job protected leave, but 10 of it paid um, at two thirds your wage. And then the um, EPSL would give you additional 10 days. So a total of 12 weeks paid if you'd stacked both the EPSL and the EFMLA leave. And this would actually um, extend the eligibility for EFMLA, that type of leave, and it would add it to EPSL. So you can see 
Um, it, it still has the caregivers, um, child is at school or the daycare is closed. Um, but also if a loved one or child is sick, if you're quarantining because of COVID-19 exposure, historically that has not been in the FFCRA if you're quarantining because of exposure, unless a doctor has told you to do so or there's a public order that you must be quarantined, which DHEC did have such a public order that you know we recommended employers follow. And we said that fell under the covered um, EPSL and e, um, the EPSL, if that were the case, if it applied that DHEC recommended a quarantine. Um, it would also require coverage for folks, um, financial income under EPSL and EFMLA for folks who needed to get time off to get the vaccine. Again, um, these benefits are benefits that the federal government will refund to the employer. So it's sort of a pass-through expense, but it is expanding them um, greatly if this is passed. And the bigger issue is keeping workforces, you know, in, in production lines and um, desks staffed. That was the, the thing that most of our employers ran into um, is actually maintaining the business operations and keeping up the production that they needed to while folks were out. So keep your ear to the ground on this. Next slide. All right, so these are some, some South Carolina bills that we have alerted folks to just keep their eye out for. And um, I'm sort of running out of time, but um, I'll give you a quick summary on this. The safe harbor, that is one that um, you know, has been discussed a lot. It's a safe harbor for employers and businesses um, to give them sort of what you would call an immunity, and it's not gonna give you immunity, but a, a defense to any claim of folks that are getting um, COVID, contracting COVID in the workplaces. Um, so workers' comp is already the exclusive remedy for your employees, that's been the case. Um, but it would give you affirmative defense for third parties um, to the extent that there was any allegation that, um, and this would be true also of employees, third parties and employees for any allegation that the employer had engaged in gross misconduct in regards to exposure um, or as in regards to third parties that the employer was negligent. Those would be the two standards about um, that would, would apply in regards to any third party or employee contracting COVID at work. Um, and it would give you, the employer, a business, um, an affirmative defense, as long as you had followed the OSHA guidance. You know, you'd been reasonable in what you'd done to protect your employees. So that is um, expected to be brought back up again. Um, and that is definitely something that um, if it passed, I think a lot of employers and businesses would feel more comfortable because <laughs> Businesses, employers have had to drop everything and implement all of these protections and try to keep workers safe and learn everything at the drop of a hat. You know, this came on us all very quickly. Um, and so, I, you know, reasonable fear and associated with whatever protections you need to do to keep folks safe at work and what liability you would have if you did not. Um, the act to establish pay equity, I think we've talked about that enough. Um, you know, I think you, that is definitely something H13, I think 3183 has been an actual bill that's been proposed year after year. There've been a number of acts in our state legislature that have been proposed in regards to pay equity. And they pretty much track what the Paycheck Fairness Act, the federal one has in place. And so again, you know, it, we'll see if it gets passed. If the federal one gets passed, then obviously that's gonna trump the state one and the need for it. The Paid Sick Leave, leave Act, um, this is an interesting act, and I think it, it'll have a hard time passing. Um, the federal government is also wanting to do family medical leave, paid um, sick leave, and they've been talking about that for a while. And again, they'll probably set the stage for that, and, uh, and to, you know, they'll probably be the first to do that. I would think that's more likely to happen than in our state. But um, it would require employers to provide a new benefit that employees currently aren't entitled to have, which no employee is legally entitled to have paid sick leave. You know, as you know, right now you have federal protections under the FMLA for 12 weeks of unpaid leave or 480 hours. Um, and you can also have additional federal protections under the ADA for additional leave as an accommodation, assuming you exhaust your federal leave. And this is assuming you're subject to the FMLA. 
um, employers under 50 do not have any obligation to provide paid sick leave. So this is an interesting act in that it would require employers to permit employees to accrue, accrue one hour of paid sick leave per 30 hours work. So that's one hour per each week. If you're a 30 hour worker, if you're a 40 hour worker, obviously it's a little higher. So that will be new and that's expensive. And so it is something to think about and reach out to your um, Congress persons if this is something that you feel strongly about. Medical marijuana and minimum wage continue to be legislation that's passed in our jurisdiction or that's put up to be um, considered in our jurisdiction. Um, it's a medical marijuana particularly um, is something that is gaining a foothold. Um, so, you know, that'll be interesting to keep up with. Um, as you know, more and more states have not only passed the right to have medical marijuana, but also legalized marijuana, um, recreational use of it. I think the last time we looked, it was 37 that um, had medical marijuana laws already in, in, in place. So it may be that that might make it through um, in the next couple of years. There is um, more acceptance of it as time goes on. The understanding is a number of folks are needing to go out of state to obtain medical marijuana. Um, apparently it is some of the more um, helpful and the more effective medication for certain conditions, including those of children. And so who knows? Minimum wage, um, we're the federal minimum wage, um, $7.25 an hour, um, and we have some lower wages applicable to disabled and such. So that may be something that the state passes. Um, but again, I think it's more likely that the federal government will pass. Next slide. All right. I think we need to, there we, oops. Still on the, there we go. I, I wanted to talk to you just briefly about um, the most recently cited, the most common cited OSHA violations. So that while we're hopefully at the tail end of COVID, um, you might go back, everybody's kind of relaxing a little bit, we're tired, um, but go back and make sure that you're not gonna fall prey to any little snares here, hopefully in the last year of having to worry too much about this. Um, the categories of the highest violations are in respiratory protection, when you're recording your occupational injuries and illnesses on your form 300 and 301 and PPE. So those are the three categories that you ought to go back and audit and make sure you're in good shape. Um, the hardest one really for employers um, would be PPE and ensuring that the folks are wearing it, ensuring that they're properly fit. And also, when do you record? And so I'll remind you that when you record any occupational illness in COVID, they added that if you get hospitalized for COVID, that is something you have to record. So if any of your employees are hospitalized for COVID and it could possibly be work-related, you need to record it. Um, work-related is very difficult to determine and OSHA has an actual statute that tells you work-relatedness and whether it is or isn't. And then they even issued guidance um, in COVID to help employers better understand whether it was work-related. And my short take on that is it's still very confusing. It's very hard for an employer to know. So typically if you're having what you perceive might be someone who has, has, a, has gotten COVID from someone else at work, that's something that I'm gonna recommend you go ahead and you put on your form. Just because you record it on your form does not mean that OSHA is going to find you violated it. In fact, it's um, more likely that OSHA will penalize you, as you can see, for not recording it. So I would encourage you, if you're not sure, but you think someone might have contracted COVID um, from exposure at your office or at your business or, you know, performing work duties, you know, at, at you know, the firehouse, I'm out, um, you know, on assignment then I would go ahead and err on the side of recording it. Next slide. So just a reminder of the respiratory protection standard. I'm not gonna read it to you. Um, next slide. And here are the respiratory protection standards that you need to make sure you're complying with. Um, the biggest one would be fit and fit tested and fit tested annually. So you might need to do new fit testing now that we're in 2021. Um, another thing too, is a lot of employees, if you have PPE and they have facial hair, which is very popular now, 
Um, they don't want to um, take their facial hair off. Well, a lot of the fit requires that there not be facial hair in certain areas so that the, the, the PPE can actually fit very securely. So it's important to deal with all of that. And if someone is you know, not following it properly, even after they've been fit tested, they need to be um, you know, coached, counseled, the, you know, the like. Next slide. More respiratory, prote respiratory protection standards and training. So training is required. Next slide. And other respiratory protection standards. So there's specific requirements in regards to those. Next slide. Occupational illness and injury. We talked about that. Fatalities, injuries, and illnesses. So if you have a fatality, if someone goes into the hospital and it's possible that they have um, contracted their COVID that's at the, um, at the workplace or performing their work duties, then you have to record it as number one, a hospitalization, which is new, and then number two, a fatality. So, and remember you have time periods that you have to report fatalities um, eight hours after the death of the employee in regards to a work-related accident. Next slide. More PPE. Um, so these were healthcare related um, fr infractions and I'm not sure if we have any healthcare um, providers on. So I would just say um, face shields, gowns and, me and medical face masks, they all need to be audited in conjunction with these statutes just to make sure you're still in compliance or that you're rectifying any non-compliance. Next slide. All right, the OSHA guidance. <laughs> I'm sort of sliding through, but I mean, you can look up these regulations and starting to get into regulations um, in an overview like this is just not helpful. We just wanted to make sure you had them. So the most important, um, get, go ahead to the next slide. Let's just hit some of the more specifics. I think we've covered those. Next slide. Next slide. Guidance by industry. This is where I wanted to get. Make sure that you are checking out your specific industry. And if even if you don't see it, I want you to go on to OSHA's website and just type in your industry. You will be surprised how much guidance there is out there specific to COVID, specific to industries, where OSHA has analyzed the positions that they believe certain industries employ and determine what level of risk they are and therefore what level of protection is required. You may recall that the 3990 guidance specifically outlined um, types of risk categories and then what OSHA thought you should do to protect the employees that fell into each of the risk categories. OSHA also decided to make its own determination in regards to specific industries as far as where they thought folks fell. So I think I mean, and there are a number of guidances that historically weren't issued per industry that are now in regards to COVID. So I would highly recommend that you check that out to make sure that you're compliant with any sort of specific industry guidance that might apply to you or your clients. Next slide. Workers' rights, we talked briefly about that. Um, so that's the biggest issue I would say is the retaliation for bringing COVID related concerns. And so I would say that it's like any other retaliation claim. A lot of times the folks that are bringing concerns are already folks that are on employers radars for other issues. Just be cognizant of how you're approaching that. That's probably a time you should get advice and counsel. All right, we've got a couple of questions. So I'm gonna slide on through these slides and see if we can answer some of the questions in the last five minutes. All right. <laughs> Danielle, Danielle says, hi, lady. And um, yes, hello, Danielle. When he said you were online, I'm like, I looked for you immediately in the participants. It's great to see you. Y'all, Danielle Gibbs is such an asset to our community um, and such a help to um, the politics and every aspect of government. She's a resource and I highly encourage you to reach out to her when you have questions. Um, I've always, I've known Danielle since years ago when we were in, um, um, leadership Greenville together, and um, she is just absolutely a bone, a benefit to our state. So Danielle, hello. Um, PROACT, just another version of the EFCA. So it's an interesting question, Alan. I, I would say yes, generally. Um, it's, it's in its beginning stages. Um, I think the bigger issue is if it is passed, it's going to be the reach that will be 
easier to prove liability for employers or businesses that did not particular historically see themselves as employers of of employees where they really thought they were truly independent and arm's length that's the thing I'm, I'm most concerned about how that impacts how you view who might be your employees um the department of labor as an example with construction already says and y'all know this that a general contractor is going to be liable for failure to pay wages of all of the subs under the general contractor. And I think you have to think about, it might be that level of exposure for any other entity that um, has other entities under it, or even not under it, but um, if you're over um, a particular project, just like in con con construction, and you have other entities that are supposed to be independent coming on board, you're going to need to be making sure that they're complying um, with the laws that you would comply with with your own employees. Next question um, in the last couple of minutes. Oh, is Jonna wants everybody to keep asking questions. So um, I think that's it. I thought there were three questions, but there's actually a nice little note from Danielle and, and only one question from Alan. So I, I guess I'm sorry, I kind of rushed through. Um, anybody have any other questions about the stuff we talked about? I know I ran through a lot of stuff. Um, I would say, keep your ear to the ground, read the blog, um, stay current with our blog, and we'll keep you updated on what might be passed, um, you know, areas that might be passed by the house that might, you know, alert you to your need to maybe get involved from the Senate standpoint, both in the state um, and in the federal legislature. And with that, Alan um, and everyone, thank you so much for having me. I hope it wasn't TMI. <laughs> It was not. I said it was going to be informative. It was very informative. Thank you so much. Um, you know, informative, but also scary. Uh, the employers that are on the call. I mean, there, there are so many things coming from so many different angles that we all need to be paying attention to. I also want to mention the fact that, you know, this year, this organization took a historic step. Uh, we, for the first time, hired a lobbying firm to represent Spartanburg interests in Columbia. And that group was very much involved with Senate Bill 147, which was a COVID Liability Protection Act in, in Columbia. Um, Senate passed that. So, so that, that was, there's some progress there. Uh, of course, I, I don't think the governor signed it yet. Um, but, but again, if you have specific issues, uh, reach out to us as well, because um, we definitely have an entire advocacy team that, that only complements the efforts of the ongoing efforts of the Upstate Chamber Coalition as well. So consider us to be a resource. Um, and again, thank you for your time and attention on this call today. I cannot log off without mentioning what John and the team have pulled together that's coming up on March 25th. Um, you know, being remote and, and doing some of our events virtually has also given us a, a lot of opportunity. And I think when you listen to what I'm about to say, you'll realize that uh, our women in business event is always very popular. It always sells out very quickly. This year, we are having speakers from CBS News New York, Eli Lilly and Company, the aerospace industry, uh, executive life coaches, and many, many more. So, I mean, these are speakers from all over the country, nationally respected um, speakers. Jonna, give me the, the tagline, because I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> all in, so meaning all intentional, all influential, all inclusive, and all indispensable. There you so go. All Not all in to be confused with Clemson. Um, <laughs> we, we remain neutral in that in that fight but we encourage you to register every person that registered is going to get a K, kdp conference gift box which kdp is short for coreg dr pepper you remember they made a 350 million dollar investment in our community they will be manufacturing six billion k cups when they are at full production so kdp is a sponsor of the women in business event as well i want to thank Wells Fargo, again, Ethan, thank you. I want to thank Regenesis. And I just want to thank each of you all for remaining engaged. Uh, we are coming uh, to the tail end of this, and I wholeheartedly believe that there's a lot of pent-up demand for real networking, um, real engagement, 
um, the old school caffeinated conversations where we were actually able to get together and have coffee and talk to one another. So be on the lookout for those. And with that, Ethan, thank you again. Chris, thank you.